this morning, I'm having a conversation with Tim Holmes about uh, a series of paintings that he did, mostly paintings, over the summer of 2020 during uh, the summer of our misery in COVID. And so I wanted to have Tim talk about these pieces and what they mean to him, and I'll talk about what they mean to me. So, Tim, uh, go ahead. Well, first of all, it, it was really over the whole, the course of the whole year, 2020, this pandemic, and that in conjunction with all of these other crises, like the, the democratic crisis of having this authoritarian figure in power, and the rise of QAnon and the sort of uh, bizarre turmoil that happened as a, as a result of the Black Lives Matter protests where people out in the streets saying, hey, we're, we're abusing part, parts of our community. And the response to that was really vitriolic and very embarrassing, I think, for America. And so all of this stuff at the same time just made me feel like the whole world was topsy-turvy. And it reminded me of this amazing adventure I had when I was in my early 20s. Traveling in Europe, I ran across this beautiful double-masted schooner and I was admiring the boat and the, the captain came on board and said, oh, we're looking for a crewman, I, do you wanna go? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> It's like my dream come true. I would, I just absolutely love that kind of, uh, you know, that seafaring spirit. I'm a little bit of Herman Melville, I think, in my heart. And so I went on board and we went on a, a cruise for, for about 10 days. And halfway through, we ran into this terrible storm that started taking the ship apart. And it was, it was terrifying. And anyway, the, this last year reminded me of that experience of being storm tossed on the water and not knowing if we're going to survive. And last year, you know, I thought, well, this might be my last year on Earth because this, this is before the vaccine was developed, before we had any idea that there was, there was going to be a slowdown or the possibility of herd immunity or anything like this and I've got a few health issues and I thought okay maybe this is my time and uh, so I kept thinking about being cast adrift on a on a stormy ocean and how absolutely up in the air everything is you just have no idea how worthy the craft is how big the seas are going to be how far the how far away help is and so all of these <clears throat> feelings came flooding back in, in terms of these images of deluges and floods and huge waves. And, um, and I just, I had to keep repeating this image over and over and over just to exercise those feelings. And I don't know how many I did, maybe close to a hundred images, I guess. Wow. So, and about, uh, 20, about 25 paintings probably. Uh -huh. So um, you want to show us some? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I thought I pulled this up. Okay, this is the one that grabbed me right at the right at the beginning, and it, it really um, it, it really tore my heart apart and. And also in, in fear, I mean, I was right with you, but uh, what I saw immediately in this image and, uh, is this boat, I guess it's a sail that's uh, flapping from the mast there. Right. Uh, right. But I, I didn't see it as that. I saw this as something like the African queen. Uh, I, I remember, the, I mean, what it triggered in my mind was the African queen. Uh, when they came out into uh, into the lake, uh, Lake Louise, I guess it is in Africa, and uh, and Humphrey Bogart and 
what's the woman's name? Catherine Hepburn? Catherine Hepburn, right. Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart were in this riverboat and all of a sudden a huge storm came up and that's what first popped in my mind when I looked at this. And so anyway, go ahead and tell your story. Well, one thing about being on the sea that people who haven't experienced that, um, if you're in a tall boat, like a cruise ship, you have a pretty good perspective of the, of the sea at a distance because you're pretty high up above the water. Right. But if you're in a small boat, you're just right at water level and you can hardly see anything beyond the next wave. Right. And so there is this sense that the world is closing in on you and the bigger the waves are, the less uh, seascape you can see. And even in a perfectly flat, calm sea, you can only see about a quarter of a mile at most. Yeah. Um, and uh, just that sense of not having a perspective is one of the things that I find frightening about about 220, 2020. Right. So, <clears throat> well, um, what it what it reminded me of um, what well later on in the year. I mean, I was trying to get my mind around this, and. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I gradually came with this idea. Uh, maybe if you unshare for a moment, let me just show you something. Uh, and so, I'll gallery view for a moment. So, um, throughout the year 2020, I was thinking about this metaphor, uh, which came up because we were talking about. Um, the Yoga Sutras of Pantanjali with Melissa Townsend. And uh, she had painted, a, done a painting of every verse. And the first painting uh, is spilled milk in the very first painting in that series that she did. And what she explained through the first five or so verses is that the whole object of, of yoga and uh, meditation is to step away from the chaos. And I've had this little red ball on my desk for, uh, I don't know, a couple of years, I suppose. And I started to see this little red ball as chaos. And it occurred to me that the purpose of all uh, religious traditions is to be able to step away from the chaos and take your mind out of the chaos and not panic over it, but step away and get a objective perspective on it. And so over the year, as, as this uh, piece that you were showing um, worked on me, I realized that it that it represents uh, the ego, which is always frightened at some level, and uh, we all have chaos all around us. And um, in terms of the sea, the reason it affects me is because um, of the the number of the hymn of the Navy hymn in the hymnal that is used at the U.S. Naval Academy Chapel, which is the Cathedral of the Navy. And if you go into that chapel, uh, you will always see the number of that hymn on the placard where hymns are posted, even when there's no service. So, you know, during a service, they'll post all the hymns they're going to sing during that service, but um, but when there's no service, they take the other hymns down, and only that number is there, and the number is 808, uh, which for unions like you and me has, has very deep meaning, and the 
the two eights represent infinity and chaos around, and the zero represents a, ma a mandala of the self. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so that piece now reminds me of the Reminds me of all of our egos that are just at sea in the universe and, right. and <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to cope. But anyway, that's that's my little story about that. But well, it, it's still pulling at my heart. So anyway, I'm going to put you back on speaker view so you can go on. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I'll just uh, kind of go through some of these. images um there's this is kind of interesting the one on the left is uh is called the narrow path i'll see if i can zoom in on it here and it's kind of fantastical but it's got this little suspended bridge with no railings you know the kind that sways in the slightest breeze and this again was a, a feeling of what that year was like. And the others, you can see a sea storm up here and this sort of uh, terrible looking uh, tornado kind of thing in the middle. Um, and I, I just did a bunch of these weather related uh, catastrophes, trying to make sense of what it's like to um, to be so vulnerable as a human being, you know, as Americans, we hardly ever have to put up with any kind of uh, difficulties like this. We've become so in, inured to a a lifestyle of privilege and ease that when the you know the slightest thing goes wrong, like uh, like a temperature drop below freezing in Texas, you know, it becomes a national catastrophe because people just aren't used to uh, having to contend with nature. Right, and aren't prepared for it at all. Yeah, so some of these, I tried to have a little bit more of an upbeat attitude. This guy is rowing in the ocean and, you know, he seems to be protected a little bit by some kind of guardian angel force or something it doesn't feel as terrifying as some of the other ones do yeah um, but then i go back to images like this it's called wide world bitten bitten and be wired and which is a line from poetry and this guy is just in a tub you know much not much bigger than half of a bathtub and mm -hmm. and he's in the middle of this storm and you just think man this guy is not going to make it it just looks so cold and forbidding he doesn't have a or you know he's he's really in a bereft situation and and yet for <clears throat> for a mariner um i've never really felt frightened in that situation i've well, been that's there good. I, I've been there many times and and I've never felt that fear except there was just one time Deb and I had taken a a charter out about 30 years ago and we well anyway the last day of the charter when we were to return the boat we were on the other side of the Chesapeake Bay uh, at a place called St. Michael's and a terrific storm had build up we were we had a 30 footer uh, that we had chartered just the two of us and we had to get the boat back <clears throat> and um, there was a southwest wind I guess so <clears throat> we could tack back but the waves were quite substantial they were like eight eight uh, feet waves and uh, of course, in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, or not in the middle, on the eastern side, there is a ship channel where the where the depth is 100 feet. And 
that has been dredged out over a couple hundred years probably. Um, and there's quite a lot of major ship traffic through that channel, which is not that wide, but it, I, I would say it's a couple hundred yards wide easily. And um, I just remember we were just approaching where that ship channel was and there were some major ships out there in the bay. And uh, all of a sudden we had this torrential downpour and we just had no concept of where these ships were. We couldn't see them anymore. And, you know, there was nothing to do but just plunge through it and, and get through it. And um, um, I'm blessed to have a seaworthy wife. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that particular trip, the, the first thing that had come up before that incident with the ship channel, obviously we didn't get run over, but uh, the day before, the night before, uh, when the storm first came up, we had incredible waves, probably 10 foot waves. And <clears throat> we were motoring and I, we were just crashing through these waves. And uh, finally I said, Debbie, please, please let me raise the jib and, and reef down the main because this is a sailboat and we have to be able to sail through it. And so she took the helm and I, I went forward and got the jib going. <laughs> and, you know, sure enough, that baby just, you know, she just loved that. And, and so it, it just, um, you know, it settled the whole thing down and we were able to get up to uh, St. Michael's, which is up the Wire River. And <clears throat> or, I guess it's the Miles River. Um, the way I was off it, but uh, it was about a 10 mile slog, I guess. And, and uh, but once we raised the jib and got a double reef main going, then this boat performed the way it was supposed to, but I, you, I was going to lose all my fillings if we had to motor. <coughs> and, yeah. so, and, uh, you know, after that, Deb had no doubt about about sailing with me, and, and she <laughs> she was an accomplished she was an accomplished sailor before I met her. But uh, this was a moment of truth. But anyway, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I digress. Well, um, I so people who don't know me, I live in Montana, right at the within site of the continental divide so it's kind of at the at the peak of where the the continent is at its highest point and uh, so I'm not very close to the ocean <laughs> but there's one of these images that is uh, part of my terror is waking up one day and seeing this huge wave coming over the mountains and you know, it's absolutely fantastical. It's a, it's a nightmare out of science fiction. But in terms of how we're dealing with the earth and the, the kind of climate catastrophe that is upon us, it feels like this is the situation we're in. So this is a local landscape with this enormous wave coming over the horizon. And here's another one that you can see this uh, little freighter motoring through a, a terrible sea. It's part of, uh, let's see, here we go. It's part of this larger painting that a very good friend of mine has. <laughs> that on the left is a Montana landscape and on the right, it turns into this, um, this ocean world and it's called Freighter Imperiled by Mountains. Yeah, fantastic image. And another good friend <laughs> has this, which is a book that I kept by my sort of chair of contemplation. It's an antique 
book of speeches. And I just, um, I've been using books to make art and this was on my pile of art materials. And so I just would use it to, to make sketches in. And I did uh, just a lot of sketches every so often, you know, I'd be sitting drinking coffee, watching the sunrise or something. And I would just have to do a sketch of another crashing wave. And this is called Storm Story. Uh, this, this one on the right is maybe a little more hopeful, Thunder Dive. Awesome. There's this person on the very top of a wave just saying, well, what the hell? I'm going down. I may as well have fun on the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if that, if that wave crashes on you, you know you're in trouble. Right. <laughs> so some of these are, are more abstract. This one is a pretty large painting and I used uh, a lot of wax and some kind of fat medium to, to really thicken up the paint because I wanted to feel the substance of the air. So this storm is feels very solid to me. It's like a, a storm of mud or something. Mm. Wind, water, light language. Yeah. And this is one of my favorites. It's called the floods clap their hands. And it's got these really pointy waves that to me is kind of a, not a naturalistic view, but more of a mythical view as if I'm imagining the story of my great grandfather's adventure. And so it doesn't feel quite as perilous, but you know that the, the person who experienced it felt it as perilous. Yeah, definitely. And uh, there's two figures in the boat. One of them is really bailing like mad and maybe the other one is just saying, well, it's beyond hope. And he's just kind of sitting there which is again, how it feels like, like with the attitude toward climate change. Yes. Yeah. Some grievance from our heart to tear. This is one that feels very cold to me. It's, uh, it, oh gosh. It feels like icy water. Yeah. And here, in the background, you can barely see this figure with his arm upraised. And these guys with a broken mast and they have fall weather gear. So obviously they were ready for a storm, but who knows if they lost this guy or they're just finding him in the sea or what the deal is. Yeah. Well, if you fall off a boat at sea, you might never get back to it. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, there, there are plenty of cases in uh, things like the the Volvo around the world race used to be called the Whitbread, where people have gone over the side and they just can't get back to them. And when you're a thousand miles from shore, <laughs> you're not going to swim it. So well, I remember reading the account of a guy who was doing some fishing in the uh, South China area, Indonesia or someplace. And he talks about leaving the boat and, and diving down to the, to the bottom to fish or look for shells or something. And if you come up and you're very far from your boat, you're in real trouble because if you're 50 feet from it, you can't see it because of the waves. Right. And it's terrifying. And you have to kind of try to swim in a circle and look for the boat. And it could be, you know, 50 feet away. Yep. It's just a, uh, it's a very, very different world. Yep. I, I, I took a woman friend of ours sailing and I, I forget what kind of boat it was. Maybe it was my sailing dinghy possibly, but I, I think it was bigger than that. And she and I went sailing on a rough day on, our, on Casanova Lake, which is only a, a mile wide, but uh, we, we went over and uh, she got caught in a, in a line as we went over the side. And 
so she wasn't coming up and I had to dive down first and and cut her or not cut her free but free her from the line so that she could come up and so there we were in the water and we were obviously close to shore not more than a half a mile and there was a fellow who had a, a skull that he was rowing out on the on the water and we were trying to get the boat over to the shore uh, which we could have done after after writing it, but we couldn't get back into it. And uh, so we were in the water for a long time. And he, at, at about 45 minutes, he looks at his watch and he says, well, you've been in the water 45 minutes. If you don't get out soon, you're going to die. <laughs> because even though the water was like maybe 70 or 75 degrees, it was the middle of the summer, that cools your body temperature down even 20 degrees is enough to kill you <laughs> anyway i digress i won't i won't go through too many more of these but uh just wanted to get people a sense of of the very the powerful trajectory of this work and now i can't get to the space bar anymore i guess that's it then <laughs> okay well, I think I think we have a sense of it. So thank you, Tim. Well, sure. Okay, so a couple more surprises. One was that when when I had bought the Upon the Breast of the Sea painting, it made me think of again the Navy hymn, which is you know so deeply infused in me that I can't even mention it without getting getting emotional. And it made me think that, well, there should be a painting that, that expresses this, which is uh, Eternal Father strong to save, whose arm doth bind the restless wave. And uh, who keeps the, uh, wait a minute. His arm doth who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. That's the next phrase. And uh, oh. so it's uh, eternal father strong to save whose arm doth bind the wet restless wave who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea and so I was thinking, wow, it'd be interesting if, if you got interested in somehow expressing that in, in a painting, something like Upon the Breast of the Sea, but expresses the arm. And um, then yes, uh, this morning or yesterday afternoon, I was looking through your, um, your uh, catalog from uh, St. Petersburg, and I found this, The Creator's Delight. Uh -huh. And so you've actually done it already. Okay. Oh. Right? Uh, let me... Let me um, I can bring up a picture of it. Yeah, I, I, well, I can also kill my virtual background. Okay, so here it is. And... Uh, you know, you, get, you wouldn't really need, um, well, I mean, you, you, would, you wouldn't need the leg, but, but. There's, there's the full sculpture. But if you had, if you did just this much um, as a wave that somehow captures that, uh, and you'd, you'd really, sort of capture the essence of that first verse of the Navy hymn. Oh. Uh, because he's got his arm around her and she's, you know, surging up. Um, so she's, you know, whose arm doth bind the restless, you know, eternal father strong to save whose arm doth bind the restless wave. 
Two bits the mighty ocean deep, it's on a point of limits keep. Yeah, uh, and it makes me think of the um, the psychological aspect of of any relationship, really, like the the relationship between the human and the ocean. Yeah. Uh, the you know the ocean has this feminine quality that is wild and untamed, and and of course the human being is always trying to 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 have control of nature and it never works <laughs> the best you can do is just be humble and listen a lot and be yeah. responsive <laughs> which is a lesson us men need to learn really seriously yeah but also uh in any time we're in relationship there's a there's a possibility of transformation and you and i know that uh but sure. but viewers might want to just look at the at the possibility of just about any art brings up a conflict and a conflict is going to be between at least two opposite poles yeah and it's the place in between where the where the conflict happens that creates the energy that produces transformation yeah and i i don't know i what came to my mind as we talked about us representing the opposites um, is that uh, looking through your your St. Petersburg catalog, I thought, oh my God, Tim has le has led the life I would have wanted to live, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and and so it's it's almost uh, like you're my shadow or my doppelganger or something like that. Oh. Right, um, because I mean, a lot of you know little things that I've done in art are, have been pretty small by comparison. But uh, we we went down similar roads, uh, and uh, you know, early in my life, I was really taken by Rodin, and and uh, when I first started to do things at Maryland Hall, I wanted to sculpt do sculpture first and I actually did some pieces that were not bad I mean they were uh but they were in terracotta and boy they that terracotta just dried out my hands horribly and I couldn't I couldn't continue and I didn't have the time or the experience to do it do it in any other form so uh, I just went to to painting and uh, mainly painting you know we have that in common we have uh, van gogh in common man have you been to the van gogh museum in oh yes yeah, yeah. It's just, one of my favorite places yeah and it's uh what always amazed me about that place um is that it was his sister-in-law that saved all his art yeah, and uh, he he had died at age thirty seven, and Theo had died six months later. His brother died six months later, and she was left. And the only thing she had, and this is in the mid eighteen nineties or early to mid eighteen nineties, there were no automobiles, but she had a thousand pieces. She had a thousand paintings by uh -huh. by Vincent. And she just loaded them up in a wagon, I guess, and took them around Europe. And uh, we have her to thank for uh, yes. for opening that art up for us. And uh, wow, just amazing. I mean, it's amazing to think that it could have been lost. It makes you wonder how many artists are out there who... Whose work we did lose. Yeah, yeah. right. Incredible. Right. Um, well, speaking so. of Vincent, who's one of my favorites, he's had a, a great influence on me. And I'll share one last painting before we go. Okay. This is um, this is called "Don't Be Afraid." Can you see this? Yes, yes. And it's full of color and light. And even though it's a stormy sea, this guy seems pretty 
confident of himself. Right. And uh, this is this is how I exited the year, really, um, feeling like, okay, we've got a vaccine coming. We've got a new president that takes us seriously. We've got a, a public that is somewhat humbled and educated about the experience. I think we're gonna, we might make it. So yeah. this is obviously feels a little more hopeful than some of the others. <laughs> yeah. Surely, and I, I definitely see the, the Van Gogh influence yeah. here. Uh, magnificent. Anyway, peace. Take care. All right, thanks. thanks. Bye -bye. See you later.